Hello and welcome to People to People, a series of informal conversations from the New Mexico Museum of Art. I'm Catherine Ware, Curator of Photography, and today I'm talking with two artists whose work is featured in the 2021 exhibition, Breathtaking, Maridel Rubenstein and Sant Kalsa. Maridel and Sant, uh, both of you have been artists and teachers for many years. Uh, you're known as photographers, but you both also have often created large uh, multidisciplinary uh, installation pieces. And I find a lot of concordances between your work. And in fact, in the exhibition, your work is installed right next to each other. And so I was really excited about the idea of bringing the two of you together for a conversation about your work. And also because both of you are very strong advocates for having a uh, a better relationship with our environment around us. So Maridel, I wonder if you would start and um, just talk a little bit about uh, how you came to that subject of um, the human relationship and the environment and the sense of place. And, um, you know, how did that, uh, was that something intentional or is it something that emerged in your work somehow? I think it was automatic. I think it was automatic that from when I started, when I started just using a camera, I was really interested in people. And I was in Vermont and I was just going around and I was always interested in their environment. And it was a rural place, but their environment and the issue became how to make a good portrait and have enough of the environment showing. And that's been my issue all forever after. And, but back then in the early seventies, what I was doing was blending a top to a bottom because when you try to make a good portrait, you, you, it to be, you have to be close and involved and then you know the, everything would fall away. So I started blending. And um, somewhere during that time, I made some kind of statement, which has really embarrassed me, but I think is good for this conversation where in, in showing how you become close, more closely connected to the environment, I said something like, the landscape for me is the stage, not the drama. And I really regret that, but I just want, but that's been my trajectory to, to kind of have some kind of balance here between the two and how the two affect each other. And that's um, really, really, that's been my focus. You know, I, always, I felt like your work in New Mexico when you first came out here quickly developed into wanting to show the connection between people and the landscape. Yeah. And that's certainly something that you've developed in, in different ways um, throughout your career. We're completely formed by our relationship to nature and to our land and to our sense of place. And what about you, Sant? How did you begin? Well, you know, what's really funny about this is that when I started making photographs, my focus uh, was also on people. And I was doing a lot of portrait work and that was in the 70s. And mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of self-portrait work and portrait work. And I was really interested in um, how a photograph could talk about relationships and speak about my ideas about feminism. And, uh, and it, it's really interesting that when I moved to California, which was actually in the um, mid to late, well, mid 70s, mm -hmm. Um, I was still focused on photographing people because I was having a very kind of interior life. I was focused on uh, my yoga practice and meditation. And then in 1980, there was a massive fire, uh, the Panorama Fire in Southern California in San Bernardino where I lived and that drew me outdoors. And so I was photographing the landscape, the environment, and I was learning more and more about um, our relationship with place, my relationship with place. Um, and, and actually uh, the curator and writer, Colin Westerbeck, uh, in an essay that he wrote about my work, I thought he made a, a, a very enlightened comment, which was, that at some point, and I'm paraphrasing because he's, he's a, a wonderful writer. Uh, at some point when I was making self portraits, I decided that I was no longer the important subject and I left the landscape and that 
place and the environment and the natural world actually became what was most important to me. Oh, I love that. I love that. I really see that in your work too. Well, since you, you led us there a little bit, could we talk for a minute about landscape and gender? Because certainly at the time when you two were coming into the field and um, starting to work outdoors and, and uh, think about landscape and, and, and environment, uh, that world was still kind of a boys club. And I'm just curious if you feel uh, that, uh, that gender has had an impact on how you portray the environment. Completely, utter, completely. It was kind of a boys club and there was a certain way of constructing a, a, a piece of land that Ansel, our great Ansel sort of started this. But one Ansel of the things- Ansel Adams. I, yeah, Ansel, pardon me. But the thing I was so concerned about in those days was that there was, no, everybody was at such a distance from, from the place, such a distance. And it was sort of this male, you know, one point perspective, this sort of gaze that stood outside and objectified, even though they're much, most of these are my friends, the most beautiful work, but there was absolutely no, no place for at least me. And, and we were commenting, Sant and I talking yesterday that our dear friend, Linda Connor was the only one who could bridge that world. I was, I was in two landscape books that came out in the early eighties. One was from Yale with Estelle Justum and the other was Mary Foresta, Heaven and Earth. Mm -hmm. like and I was, oh, they sort of stuck me in there because I was the only one that had something human in the picture. <laughs> and I, you know, I had this little, this little entry just briefly. <laughs> The landscape, we are part of the landscape, right? <laughs> you know, what's, what's really interesting about the time that I was began photographing, first of all, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Joshua Tree, California, and I've lived in Southern California since 1975. And, and I was photographing uh, starting really in 1980. And, um, a lot of the areas that I was photographing, which are San Bernardino, Riverside, Redlands, are the same area that several of the new topographic photographers were working in in the same time. I mean, Joe Deal was making photographs there, uh, Robert Adams, uh, Louis Baltz. And actually, um, I had taught at the same universities at the same time with Joe Deal, Louis Baltz. Um, but I was, I had a very, very different um, perspective. Uh, first of all, the work that I did at the time, I called intimate landscapes. They were really small. Like I printed them about three by four and a half inches in size. And my approach was to make images that were about a very intimate relationship with place. It wasn't about showing the grandiose landscape. It was thinking about more about what is my personal relationship with the natural world. You know, if I was photographing water, that's water that's goes through my body. If I'm photographing smog, I'm thinking about that I'm breathing that smog. And so it was more about the impact that I have on the environment and the environment has on me. Oh, I love that. And I think that's what really attracted me to both of your work for the show was that breath is a connector in that sense, in that that's one of our most intimate connections with our environment and it's an exchange with our environment. Um, I wanna have you both talk a little bit about your work that's in the show and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, knock it back over to Maridel, but uh, after that, Sant, maybe you would talk too a little bit about um, the concept of ecofeminism too and how that uh, plays into your work. Okay. So yeah, Maridel, the, we, we have, uh, four of your photographs in the exhibition and tell us a little bit about those and how they connect with the idea of breath. They, they, are, they are part of a, a, a trilogy, but they are focused on photosynthesis. And photosynthesis to me is all about the breath. It's about the symbiotic, incredibly wonderful, Edenic symbiotic relationship we have with nature that we breathe out and, and feed the trees carbon dioxide and they breathe out, they take it in, 
and turn things into sugars and they survive and then they breathe out their oxygen and we survive. It's Edenic, it's perfect, it's all we need. If they had a little bit of fruit, we could survive forever and nuts and seeds. It's the perfect, <laughs> perfect relationship. And one thing I wanted to say, I need to get this in here, is that our breathable atmosphere is only 10 kilometers high, up above, just about at the clouds, just above the clouds. We can't, there's not enough oxygen after that. So it's a really small world that, that sustains us mm -hmm. and we are polluting it, we're filling it up with junk. And so the photosynthesis work is somewhat of, it's about a lost Eden that everybody's kind of trying to hold on. They have oxygen masks on. They're trying to get their last breath, their last bit of oxygen from these trees because there's not enough left. There's not going to be enough for us to breathe. And so breath in that sense of that Edenic relationship is, a, it's all about breath. And it goes all the way back in time to the big bang, you know, out of something, out of nothing, something a breath happens and we begin. How do you begin to approach something like that as a visual artist though? Oh, so that what was really great is I have a friend that's a director of a center for the environment at Harvard. And he asked me to, to if I could make him some pictures about carbon cycles that would pierce the hearts of the, the, um, the, the energy CEOs he had to talk to. He said, I need them to feel that carbon is as close as their own skin. And so the first thing I wanted to do was photosynthesis and that idea of embodying it, you know, that, that breathing in and out, that we're, we're right there. And so I just staged these kind of rituals of people with oxygen masks on, and it, it all relates to the seasons. So there are people with, with um, there, are, there are images that are about equinox, over one year period, solstice, equinox, solstice, equinox, and then there are seasonals without people in them. And they'd all, and so I use that circle. In the images, you'll see that there's this circle. And, it, it represents it represents the earth, it represents the atmosphere, and it represents the oxygen molecule to me. So I printed the images on very thin paper. And then there's a little chopstick that holds them in the frame. So they hopefully they you'll feel the lightness of being that they kind of float. Right. That well, that gets back to this idea that I feel you the two of you share that's a, a motivation in your work, which again is about really our our connection with earth. Uh, Sant, so your uh, piece, your installation in the show is called The Sacred Breath. Tell us a little bit about that. What will people see? And um, how do you articulate the idea of breath as a visual artist? Well, let me start with the origin of this piece, which is um, I actually did The Sacred Breath for the first time as a meditation installation in 1992. So this is a site specific piece that's being done for this exhibition. And it's had some changes made to it for this time during the pandemic. And, you know, uh, for the site of, of the exhibition in the museum. Um, but the way that the piece started was I was invited to be in an exhibition at the California Museum of Photography at UC Riverside. And the exhibition- Back in the 90s, right? Right, 92. And the exhibition was titled Smog, A Matter of Life and Breath. And each of the artists in the exhibition was paired with a research scientist at UC Riverside working in the uh, air quality or air pollution research center. And the professor and research scientist that I was working with, Dr. Paul Miller, was doing all this research on the impact of ozone pollution on forests. So I asked um, Dr. Paul Miller, the collaborating scientist that I was working with, uh, what was the one thing that I could do as an individual that would have the most impact, positive impact on air quality in Southern California, especially in the San Bernardino Riverside area? And he said, Perfect. Plant trees. Plant trees. Plant trees. I mean, I thought he was going to say, you know, get a low emissions vehicle or something like that. I, I mean, I didn't know what he was going to say. And he just said, plant trees. So I did some research and I found out that there was a large reforestation project going on in the San Bernardino National Forest at Holcomb Valley, 
which is where the gold rush was in Southern California. And the area had been decimated by the gold rush, by clear cutting, by cattle grazing. And, well, and also um, the, the pollution in the air was affecting how the trees were growing, as I recall, right? Yes, absolutely. And that was what Dr. Paul Miller was doing research on. Um, and uh, I mean, he is preeminent in that, in that field. And uh, so I, I planted actually over a thousand trees as part of this big reforestation project, which is a project that I'm working on now going back, which is called Growing Air. But the piece, um, the sacred breath came out of the experience of planting those trees because I have this yoga and meditation background. And I found that when I was planting these trees, I was getting down on the ground. I was putting my hands in the earth and, and planting these seedlings. And it was this repetitive motion that felt like I was bowing to the earth. Beautiful. And I thought, I need to do a piece that is about that experience. Um, and, and something, so I took all of these other things that are part of my life experience, like yoga and meditation and altars and prayer wheels and uh, you know and made this experience which is about our interdependence with trees the, which is through the breath which is the life force that sustains all of us and that's what the piece is about mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really wonderful thing to experience. I hope people will have a chance to see it in person. And as Sant said, we did have to take away some of the interactive elements uh, because of COVID safety precautions. So that's that's tough, but um, there's so much there to experience. And, and there, it, it, there's a kind of a quiet space where you, you can go in and, uh, and contemplate that relationship with breath. and. Uh, and have some quiet time. So that's, well, that's yeah. really effective. Well, the, you know, the central piece in, in the sacred breath is a lung shape photograph of tree branches being sort of the internal space of our lungs, you know, the, like the bronchial bronchi. Um, and there's also <laughs> prayer wheels, um, that have prayers in them uh, related to trees that are constantly rotating. So it's sending out that energy um, as in Buddhist belief. And then there's a, a prayer book of images of all different types of trees and the words inhale, exhale to take the viewer through mm. a breath meditation. And there's a sound element, which is me breathing and the wind. So my breath becomes the wind and the wind becomes my breath. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I really felt like that, putting the tree branches in the lungs together with the lungs, that was a really great visual and visceral way to convey your message, you know, without any words at all. And uh, Meridal, well, during the pandemic, you, you created a new piece, didn't you, with, with lungs and branches? It's, it's a piece that's called lungs and lungs needing oxygen. And it's really similar. It's just that I use the rib cage and then I make the lung sacs out of these branches that are actually in the shape of a lung sac. So they're inside the rib cage. And, um, and then it, it's all, it's also this whole, this image is placed within a, the water, the air, the earth, all these elements that go around it. But it was actually the same thing. And just this, you know, this belief I have in photosynthesis to save us. So I wanted the tree branches to get in there to provide the, the oxygen, the air. Everybody, what we were seeing is nobody could breathe during the beginning, you know, that's still true, but in the beginning, the story is right. a breath. So I was trying to get those glaciated um, bronchi to be transformed by the oxygen that the trees would provide. Um, yeah, that's right. And because of the pandemic and because of some of the other the things that happened during 2020, the show has uh, added resonance, shall we say. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, I just thought that was amazing that you two found your way to something uh, yeah. so similar to articulate that connection uh, without, yeah, no, you know, without yeah. knowing the other was doing that. Yeah. 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 Uh, Meridale's piece, that new piece, is absolutely gorgeous. 
Well, um, Merida Alsant talked a little bit about some of the spiritual elements that she's engaged with her piece. Uh, what about you? Do you feel that um, that that has bearing on your work? I know you call your your whole cycle of images that you're working on Eden turned on its side, which of course ha makes that bib biblical reference back to a time when we we were more unified with our environment. It's sort of trying to get to that whole trilogy of Eden turned on its side is dealing with time in different ways, but um, but it's really trying to get us back to our sense of origination. And the, the thing that's Edenic is, the, is, the, is this photosynthesis, this carbon cycle that sustains us. It's Edenic, our connection in and out to this planet and you know, the planet that we have to care for. And I, I think I should say that, that that photosynthesis didn't start out as having a title about Eden. It, I realized that as I made those pictures, they were about an Edenic state that had lapsed. And so, after, so out of that, it had me in the next two series, one's about volcanoes and one's about Iraq, of actually looking with the volcanoes, looking for the point of origin, because with the volcanoes, that tectonic activity is what it actually melted snowball earth and eventually allowed that blue-green algae to be transformed, to come to us through photosynthesis, and those little critters became us. And then finally with Iraq, this place that only suffers, that it's where the Tigris and Euphrates, one of two places where the Tigris and Euphrates cross. And it's right there. And so, so the, Mar the, the ancient Mesopotamians were still there. The Marsh Arabs like to think of that place as the actual his garden of the site of the Garden of Eden. So I've been working there making a wastewater garden that will clean the water. And so that's sort of, none of that's exactly spiritual reference, but I'm always feeling when I'm in Iraq as a, as a, a Jubu, you know, Jewish Buddhist, that somewhere I'm right there with my people. The Pope is going to Ur tomorrow, which is where I work. It's, I've been on top of Abraham's house on his roof. You know, it's, it's so you feel like you're at the beginning of things and what went wrong. Well, I guess the question is, how do we get back to the garden? Can we get back to the garden? I feel like both of you have been very uh, positive in your messages, uh, your advocacy to people to wake up and, and be more connected rather than uh, giving a message of doom. Uh, <laughs> what would you, um, what do I want to say about that? Um, what do we think about that? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the piece in the show, The Sacred Breath, I, I use the word sacred and, um, and I'm using these elements that come from different spiritual practices. But what I believe is most sacred is the breath of life and, our, and the natural world, which sustains us. Um, and I, you know, one, one of the things that's also in the piece is there's chemistry flasks on the altar and they're, they have earth, air, water, and fire in them. Or they have, I should say, the fire, because I don't want to burn down the museum here. Thank you. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually charcoal. So it's, it's burnt wood. And there are seeds, um, ponderosa pine seeds on the altar as well. And one of the things that I think, you know, think about is that, you know, for me, science is really important in terms of solving our problems. And that, you know, the, uh, I have so much respect for scientists who are working to understand our ecosystems, not try to control them, but to actually learn that they're, they are perfect in, they are, perfection. And what we need to do is learn to be more, that we're already part of nature. We are nature. And instead of trying to change, control um, the natural world, that we should be a part of it and learn from it. And that would solve our problems. And get in sync with the rhythms and the cycles. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's what's wonderful about Meridel working. Her pieces have titles that relate to the equinox and, you know, the, the changing of, of, of time and, 
what we're thinking about right now is how, what effect kind of effect our art could possibly have in these troubled times. And Sant said some beautiful things about how, you know, coming from her own personal experience. And it got me thinking about something I think about as the artist's job, at, at least for photographers, that images come in through our eyes upside down and backwards. And we mirror them right side up. And it's the same thing. I use a view camera. It's the same thing that it comes in through the lens. The image comes in upside right. down. And, backwards. and with my students, I have them do a, a meditation with their image to turn it right side up. And so I've always said that the artist's job is to take that upside down image and write it, make it right. And that's what I think we do. We're trying to mirror back what is going on in some kind of emotive, you know, expressive way that can grip people. And so for me right now, and the and what our job is, I think our, our, my job right now is trying to figure out how to get people to let go of their anthropocentric behavior. And I'm speaking to myself first. So I'm making this hall of mirrors of, of creatures and flora and fauna and other stuff that um, when you look at them and there'll be documentation of what they are, but when you look at these mirrors, you have to, you'll see yourself too. And so the real question is, can you stay focused on this creature and this information? Are you going to keep, and you are, you're going to keep looking at yourself. And so that's this, this play we have to, we all have to reprogram ourselves. We have to reeducate ourselves that we, when we go outside and walk, that we're just a little speck there walking. And there's all this other stuff going on. So that's sort of my intention right now. But that's what I think both of our intentions are, are to get people to experience things, experience nature, to, to participate in a different kind of way. Well, one of your pieces that does that very directly is uh, in, in the show is a woman wearing an oxygen mask that's literally hooked up to a tree. And so that's, you know, in terms of seeing yourself, seeing ourselves, yeah. that's pretty direct. Yeah, I, I totally relate to what Maradell is saying. Oh, and I wanted, I wanted to go back to a, a question that you asked uh, about ecofeminism. Right. I mean, I, I consider myself an ecofeminist artist and a lot of people ask, well, what does that mean? And I actually have a statement here that I wrote, um, which I like to use because it really kind of clarifies it. So I'm just gonna read it. Um, for those not familiar with ecofeminism, it's an academic and activist movement that sees critical connections between the domination of nature and the exploitation of women in a patriarchal society. Ecofeminists advocate an alternative worldview that values the earth as sacred, recognizes humanity's dependency on the natural world, and embraces all life as equal and valuable. And for me, that's kind of my life philosophy that, that I live by. I mean, but, and, and getting back to the sacred breath, you know, that connection with the natural world is a very sacred one. Does that resonate with you, Maridel? Completely. I've, I've, I've been out of academia a little bit. So, I, I mean, I'm not out of, I actually still was teaching, but ecofem, I'm, I, I think I'm an ecofeminist. I haven't done anything or in any organized fashion about it. I think in this past year, what's really resonated for me that fe there's fem there's so many intersectional issues about the environment and, and women are one, people of color are another, animals are another. So I can't, I, and I, um, so I always get a little nervous about, you know, aligning with just one thing. I love that both of you have planted many seeds, many ideas with your work and also literally have been working, uh, Sant, you planted, you planted so many trees and Meridel, you're working to restore a garden. So that's, that's really lovely. Um, well, there's so much more to say, but we're going to end our conversation. And we found out as we were making this recording that our colleague, Dr. Naomi Rosenblum has died. And so we'd like to dedicate our talk today to her memory and to her accomplishments. Uh, she was a really important photo historian and author of A World History of Photography, as well as uh, A History of Women Photographers. So um, we, we, we really have uh, all have a great debt of gratitude to her and a great appreciation of her as a person. And if anyone would like to find out more about Sant or Meridol and their work, you can find them easily on the internet 
and they have also published books, which you can order from your independent bookseller. So uh, thank you both so much for talking with me and um, thank you for being part of our exhibition breathtaking. Thank you. Thank you.